So what we've learned is you have to protect your liver, which we've been talking about, and you have to feed your gut. And what, do you, what does the gut want to eat? It wants to eat fiber. Fiber is the food for the bacteria. Well, let's take that to the extreme and talk about somebody who is fasting or somebody that adopts a carnivore diet or a primarily meat diet and they're seeing certain health benefits in that realm. Is that only temporary or is, is there exceptions when we go to those extremes when it comes to the gut? So fiber, fiber is the natural food for the intestine. And what the, the bacteria in the intestine can chew up fiber for its own purposes. And one of the things it will do is it will turn that fiber into a secondary product called the short chain fatty acids, SCFAs. And those short chain fatty acids have effects on us. They are anti-inflammatory. They keep inflammation down. And gut inflammation is one of the primary sources of chronic metabolic disease. So keeping your gut placated and generating short chain fatty acids is part and parcel of improved metabolic health. So fiber is the primary driver of that. However, there are other things that bacteria can do to, you know, consume, you know, to metabolize the nutrients it needs and also generate short chain fatty acids. So fiber is necessary to keep your gut happy, but your gut will secondarily be able to chew on amino acids and uh, or other organic acids that you can find in regular in, in, in meat and other foods that will do just as well. You know, I am not against a carnivore diet. And I've not been against a carnivore diet for a long time. Okay? I don't advocate it, but I'm not against it. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to move here. But do you see that chair over there? I do. There's a lot yeah. of stuff on it right now. Okay? But you see that chair? That is a very important and special chair. Okay? That chair belonged to a man by the name of Williamer Stephenson. Williamer Stephenson was an explorer. He was born in North Dakota from, to Icelandic parents, didn't speak English until he was 17, went to Harvard though, ultimately went to the Arctic, was um, shipwrecked amongst the Inuit for two years before he was rescued and recognized that the Eskimos, the Inuit, had no diabetes, no heart disease, and no cancer. And so he was a little bit of an anthropologist as well as being an explorer. He was one of the founding members of the Explorers Club. He wrote many books, one called Cancer, a Disease of Civilization, and he trained the ski troops during World War II for the Brunner Pass. William R. Stephenson was an American hero. That chair behind me was William R. Stephenson's Harvard chair. And my mother's late husband's brother-in-law was William R. Stephenson. And we owned Stephenson Farm for many years in Bethel, Vermont. Really very fascinating story. Bottom line, William R. Stephenson knew that you could live on whale blubber, you could live on meat, and be perfectly healthy. So he and his partner in the, um, in, in the Arctic exploration checked themselves into NYU Bellevue back in 1926 and lived on the metabolic ward at NYU Bellevue for a year and ate only meat, only meat, for one solid year. And it turned out at the end of the year, they were healthier than the investigators who were studying them. And of course, this got written up in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, 1928, and multiple papers about it. And it's one of the reasons he wrote the book, Cancer, Disease of Civilization, etc. Point is, you can be on a ketogenic diet, you can be on a carnivore diet, and it will work. It will work, okay? And there are many, many um, uh, uh, tribes that consume nothing but meat and milk, the Rendelia, the Tokelau, the Maasai, the 
Inuit. Okay. And they are fine because this is their indigenous culture and because you can get enough out of a carnivore diet to be able to maintain health. You can also get enough out of a um, uh, gatherer diet okay, and to maintain health. But in order to do so, you have to eat the requisite fiber. And you mentioned there the fact that the gut bacteria can actually feed on other things besides fiber yes. when somebody's consuming only meat. That's right. Exactly. So there are ways, different ways to do it. And I'm not married to either one. I'm very agnostic in terms of this. People get to choose. But the one diet that never works, not in the history of mankind, is the standard American diet. That's the diet that doesn't work. I realized when I threw that last question to you, I lumped together carnivore plus fasting. And obviously, you know, the nuance of your answer there, the fact that gut bacteria can feed on on meat and not necessarily just fiber leaves the fact that what happens when we fast? Well, and what it does is it makes the gut bacteria want to grow. It makes them want more. And if you don't feed your gut bacteria, your gut bacteria will feed on you. So it will actually strip the mucin layer right off your intestinal epithelial cells. So it will find its food. Okay. And now your intestinal epithelial cells don't have the physical protection that it needed to keep the gut microbiome at bay. I mean, your intestine is a sewer, okay, at every level, okay? There's a lot of in your intestine. And the goal is to keep that in the intestine and not in your bloodstream. So there are three barriers in your intestine to separate you from the junk in it. The first is the physical barrier, the mucin layer. And like I said, if you don't feed your gut, your gut will feed on you. The second barrier is the biochemical barrier. They are called tight junctions. They are proteins that link the intestinal epithelial cells together so that things can't get through. But there are things that can poison those tight junctions and then they come apart and things can get through. That's called leaky gut. And the things that can damage those tight junctions are wheat gluten and people who are gluten allergic. They're called celiac disease. Those tight junctions, like the example of that is zonulins. That's what goes wrong in celiac disease. They go like that. Um, but it turns out fructose nitrates those tight junctions and renders them ineffective also. So glucose can, ba uh, sorry, fructose can basically generate leaky gut all by itself. And then third, the third barrier is the immunologic barrier. So your intestine has more immune cells than the rest of your body put together. It's got all these things called Peyer's patches where all the lymphocytes hang out. And those lymphocytes are special kinds of lymphocytes. They are, I, uh, they are Th17 cells and they make a cytokine called IL-17. And their job is to basically patrol the entire gut and make sure that stuff doesn't get across. Recent paper out of Ivanov's group at Columbia showed that on a regular whole foods diet, those Peyer's patches, those Th17 cells, that IL-17 is all functional working and the barrier is intact. On a ketogenic diet, a high fat diet, low carbohydrate diet, it's also intact and keeps all the junk out. And the uh, 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 Th17 and the IL-17 is fine. The minute you add sugar to the fat, now that barrier is not there. The immunologic barrier has been broached. The Th17 cells are missing. The IL-17 is way down. And fat it, from the intestine starts conglomerating on the other side and gets into the bloodstream, which can then cause inflammation. And then tying back to what we talked about before, sugars in nature are going to be found with fiber. And this is going to form this lattice work that I know you've talked about before on the show right. on, the on our first conversation. And I've heard you talk about it on other podcasts where the soluble fiber and insoluble fiber, they mesh together and form that barrier, which is going to slow down digestion. Right. 
So that's the, that's the man-made barrier, as it were, or the food barrier. So there's really four barriers, but three are inherent in the intestine, and one is dependent on the food. And the bottom line is, the goal is to keep your barrier intact. And, you know, we're not. We are basically destroying that barrier, therefore generating gut inflammation, therefore generating systemic inflammation, therefore generating mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. Ultimately, it's not what's in the food, it's what's been done to the food that matters. Everything fructose does to the mitochondria is designed to inhibit its functioning. It's metabolic health that drives...